Hello everyone and welcome to the 16th installment of our Risen series. I am your host, Ares or Doma on multiple social media outlets and I am joined by my lovely cast of Arisen Actors. As per usual, D&D Universe brings you this and if you want to get more in touch with us, you can always find the links to our discords in the description below or get to us on various social media sites in the description below. If you're watching us live or on YouTube, you can find us live at twitch.tv forward slash DND Universe. Shows live 5.30 CST on Thursday for our Risen series and Saturday for our Draenor series, alternating on weeks of course. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Just for those who might be joining us for the first time, we're going to be doing something a little bit special and going through our list of actors and who they play on our show. Starting at the left of your screen, the white-haired Casanova inventor himself, uh, Raldir Silverleaf Azimar, played by Delta. Hello. Moving on to the uh, larger fellow, the scaled fellow, the gray alligator-like lizard man himself, played by Matoid Mortician on social media outlets, but a dear close friend of mine, Alex, playing Yizit. I like being a dear close friend. And hello. Moving on to his counterpart, the short and plucky airship captain, alchemist extraordinaire, gnome inventor, my best friend in the entire world, Grafford, played by Yosh. Excuse me, universe, and hello. And last but not least, the Ever lovable, fun, and enjoyable Pitan, played by none other than a blue flan or Angie. And as I said before, I am your host, Ares, or Doma, on several social media outlets. And without further ado, I believe it is time for us to get into our last time on Arisen D&D. Our heroes have been split up. Raldir and his sister, the young royalty of the Silverleaf Kingdom in the southern half of Amali, have been taken by an organization known as the Phoenix Rebellion. After spending several weeks in captivity, the production of a magical firearm called the Thunder Cannon, originally invented by Raldir has been supposedly mass produced and armed this rebellion after his capture. Our heroes, working with the Silverleaf Kingdom, sent out on a mission after finding reports of a floating island in the sky with a large plume of black smoke coming out from the spire upon its mountain peaks. After spending a few weeks making upgrades to Grafford's airship Old Rusty, the party embarked with the help of Twergeth Woodnot, a rather intriguing individual, and headed out towards the Isle of Cinder. Upon arriving, they were met by the forces of the Phoenix Rebellion, and after a short skirmish were forced to retreat, though Twig, with his desires to get to the young prince, Raldir, shot off and threw some spectacular rolls on both ends, was able to make contact with Raldir, offering him, him an escape before Raldir denied Torgeth this victory. After clenching a mossy covered stone, he disappeared into leaves. Meanwhile, the airship being pushed away rapidly for an escape via the use of one of the druids among the ship, their usage of the gust of wind spell got them very far away from the action, forcing the party to leave Torgeth behind. And it is at that moment that we are going to rejoin our story. After the decimation of the skirmishing just on the outskirts of the island, several members of your scouting party are unconscious on the deck. 
the druid brings their arms down after finishing the casting of the spell and collapses down onto one knee. And that is, we will make our scene. Uh, DM. Yes. Do the attacks that we were hit with count as magical? Um, yes. Okay. I forgot last time to mention Heavy Armor Master, so I figured I'd clear it up. All shots from these Thunder Cannons are considered magical. Gotcha. So, what would everybody like to do? Dawn's pretty beat up, so she's pretty uh, Knocked out. Yeah, she looks really <laughs> bad right now. How many people are unconscious on the deck of the ship right now? There are... Well, let me get the Five? exact numbers... There are one, two, three, four, five people unconscious. Yes, uh, two sol- uh, three soldiers uh, of the Iron Grove um, military, uh, a druid uh, we sort of know where they're from, and Patan are all unconscious on deck. Um, the captain of the small group of soldiers, Jessa, is. Very, very, very roughly beaten, I guess we'll say. On the verge of uh, falling unconscious as well. Hmm. Rufford, as you are at the helm of the ship after being forced to leave behind Twergeth, what do you do? I'm just going to fly back in silence fly back towards the kingdom or towards the island towards the kingdom all right so you to keep going you stay on course um locking the altitude and essentially manipulating uh the controls of the airship to simply just drift on the um the currents and you kind of just stand there in stunned silence after realizing the capabilities of the people who have taken the young royalty. As Yizit sees uh, Grafford kind of release the wheel and go into autopilot, he's going to stomp up the steps and spin Grafford around not very gently by the shoulder. As you're doing that and as you're making your way across the the deck of the ship, um, the robed individual uh, is starting to go towards each of the... um, fellows that are unconscious, including Patan, um, and pops all of them a level one cure wounds, which is enough to get everybody um, up from being unconscious. So Patan, you are also um, conscious once again, but everybody is still looking really, really rough. I'm gonna make a medicine check. How much health would you say? Just one hit point? Uh, Yeah, you're up with one. And then the same robed figure begins to tend to the uh, rest of the injured folk. So, is it what else are you going to do? Uh, once Grafford is spun around in my direction, is it's going to kneel down to where he's as close to Grafford's height as possible, and he's going to say. Um, Hmm. We're flying in the wrong direction, gnome. Our enemies are the other way, and we could have used this ship. We're not going to strike back. them. Weakness. And you said, "Well, actually, somehow, without lips, spit on the ground and walk away." Hmm. Sort of just. You use your tongue to, to push it outwards, and it just flies out at a velocity um, and lands um, next to or on Grafford? Um, probably two or three feet away, just right. like off to his right. And then what will you do? He's just going to go to the bow of the ship and right. hold his sword, and just he is... 
disassociating. He's not talking to anybody. All right. It's on. What are you doing? She's probably laying on the ground right now. Um, just trying to, just thinking, am I alive? <laughs> sort of shell-shocked after, um, and still trying to process everything that happened in the moments past. Um, and those of you who are sort of just uh, keeping an eye on the situation, um, the druid, um, whose name is Thistle, by the way, um, begins to take those who can walk uh, below deck to treat them in safety. Um, and it's going to be a couple of hours of flying without... Uh, the usage of magical propulsion. Uh, propulsion. Are we on fastest route? From what I can tell. Um, if you'd like, you can rearrange your attention to try and maybe get there a little faster. Uh, I think I will. All right, go ahead and make a nature check and add your proficiency if you are not already proficient. <clears throat> All right, I'll make sure to do so. We get a read on the winds, and, uh... That'll be a 15. It's actually strangely still. There's not much wind. Though, you can see as you're trying to read the currents and watch the sails and how they, how they move, you do see off in the distance thunderclouds in the direction that you're headed probably going to rain not enough to be a hindrance it's not quite the density at which a storm would um subject potential damage to the airship but enough so that you'd be able to tell that it's probably going to rain today is anyone still on deck um, there's, yes, actually, Jessa is still on deck. Um, he's taken his helmet off, revealing, a uh, long, uh, golden blonde hair, um, and these sort of pale, pale green eyes. Um, he's bleeding from the side of his head and sort of just leaning up against one of the, um, I'm not sure what they're called, but what the, the sails um, hang from that wooden pole. Masts. Yes, from one of the masts. Um, and just propped up against it, sitting on the ground. You can see uh, puncture wounds all over his armor from where uh, the ammunition of the thunder cannons had pierced through and singe marks from the lightning. Kind of just with a thousand yard stare. Um, Pitan is still, uh, and Yizit is still on deck. Though Yizit is... Uh, perched up at the bow of the ship, kind of just gazing off, uh, unmoving, and Paton is also with that same thousand-yard stare. It kind of remi reminds you of a war zone, the aftermath of one, at least. I'd like to mention at this point that Yizid is extremely covered in wounds and blood. He's not far from falling over. But you still hold that same confidence that same powerful stance as this type of pain while is still painful through your determination for combat and achieving the mission you're sort of just ignoring a majority of it right now okay just wanted to make sure that wasn't a factor Grafford, what do you do? It's gonna be a long trip home. I'll just say that out loud and we'll keep flying. And you stay at the helm. And about an hour of silence passes. Everybody staying in the same state until the silence is broken by Jessa the sound of his armor rustling together metal against metal and he slowly uh, 
stands himself up and walks over to the side of the of the ship and is standing next to Paton who is still sitting on the ground and extends an arm downwards. Paton is gonna take his arm and help uh, get up. He helps you stand up, um, still wordless. A majority of the blood has somewhat dried at this point and, and set, um, turning that darkish brown color. And he just gazes off over the over the side of the railing. Katon is gonna just stare at him for a moment, and then she's also gonna get stare off to the side as well. The ocean of trees underneath you in the southern jungles of Amali. Um, Almost like a an ocean of green, just swaying in the wind. The wind starting to pick up slightly as you draw nearer and nearer to the storm. Go ahead and make another piloting check for me, which is nature. At this point, DM? Yes. Uh let him get this first 21 you take advantage um, of the winds starting to come in your favor and you do begin to move slightly faster along is it is it is going to take one of his claws and drag it along his jawline on the right side and just kind of tear that open for a new scar um all right you take four points of slashing damage fair enough and it bleeds profusely you cut deep enough that and wide enough that it will leave a scar Though you kind of have to move your hands underneath the helmet that was made for you. Um, but with a single uh, fluid motion, you do so. Sounds good. Thank you. Does anybody want to do anything else? Mm -mm. alright then so you begin to make your way back towards the kingdom or rather in the direction of the kingdom and as you do so the rain starts to come down as you slowly begin to descend you make your way down into the forests though from this height um, and from the magical enchantments that have been placed on these woods you are not able to quite see the valley where Iron Grove resides. Um, at this point, would I be able to make a navigation or perception check? Uh, yeah, go ahead and make a perception check. Uh, probably with advantage because I'd be looking around to like no uh, it's up to you who takes it no just just make a straight perception check because you're trying to see past the enchantments <laughs> six it's strange it's difficult to you um, are coasting about maybe 40 or so feet above the canopy um, when Jessa uh 
speaks for the first time in the two and a half hours that it took to get to your destination. Oh, yes, that's right. And he reaches uh, for his neck and pulls off um, some sort of necklace with the same type of green, green gemstone um, that the signet rings are made out of. Um, and it looks very shoddy, and it reminds you of something that uh, Ponzi made. Um, and he holds it up, and it begins to slightly glow, and then rise until almost like a compass begins to point in the direction. And with his heavy footfalls of the armor here... The sounds of the rain hitting the wooden boards of the ship. He makes his way up the stairs um, and stands next to you, holding the directional pendant. And after following in the direction of where it points as you turn left and right, um, you see that the, um, the pendant moves in that same level of space, altering where it's pointing, and go ahead and make a, a straight intelligence check, Rafford. Mm-hmm. Nine. It takes you a little while, but eventually um, you get to a position where it just points straight down, um, and you pull a lever and you begin to descend. And it seems almost as if you're about to crash into the canopy above, but then as you begin to get closer and closer, the illusion almost passes over you. Almost as if submerging under a veil of water, you watch the illusion pass. And you are coasting maybe about 200 or so feet over the valley that, dent, that sort of dips into the earth. And you see the familiar ring of trees of Iron Grove with the cliff sides um, around it, the cascading waterfalls. And you begin to sail downwards towards the sort of front entrance, though it is not quite apparent which one that was immediately. Go ahead and make a history check. Eleven. After looking at some of the rivers that flow in the valley, you take a moment, um, but with Jess's help, um, you get around to the front, um, where, uh, just about where you had taken off from before. Over the course of the day, the travel to and from the encroaching dusk is starting to set in. The hours of twilight fill the sky with the extravagant pinks and purples and oranges dance on the skyline. The clouds almost disappearing and then encroaching once again as the rain clouds begin to move over southern Amali. You touch down and Jessa wordlessly begins to go under the deck during the descent and rallies those who were being treated underneath. The airship makes touchdown and you've returned. What would everybody like to do? Katan is gonna wait for everyone to get off the ship first before she gets off. Because it's not getting off the ship. Yes, it's not even really moving. Grafford? Grafford? 
Right, so the rest of the squadron that came with you begins to make their way down the rope ladders on the side um, and slowly but surely uh, moving the injured around. Um, it does it does take some time to get them off of the very large airship, though following in tow, uh, Grafford, you weigh anchor and get the airship to stay in its place um, and you make your way back towards the wooden walls so to speak of Castle Iron Grove you make your way inside um, Jessa holding up the pendant once again to have the trees part and make an entryway the guards have lessened in their interrogation of the people after the recent information that was brought to light about the Isle of Cinder. And everybody makes their way uh, inside, minus Yizit. Yizit, as you stand steady, in that same position at the bow of the ship, the rain hitting against your armor and gently rolling down the beads of water along your arms and your body and your legs to your tail. I'd like you to make an intelligence saving throw. Okay, just a second. Normal or advantage? Normal. 16. A vision comes flashing into your mind. The water, as it slams against your face, you see brief flashes of a wooden vessel sinking. People bobbing in the water. People with green scales or skin. And then it leaves you. And the same instance that it came. Was this a memory or a vision? You're not sure. Hmm. I'd like to throw my sword across my shoulder and walk below deck to go into my swamp. And you do so. You make your way underneath the deck of the ship and make your way to your door. The same three claw marks dragged diagonally across. And you make your way inside to the familiar swamp Remove your armor and weaponry. Slowly sink into the swampy water. Filled with a film of greenish algae or moss that seems to have set in and grown. As I'm sinking into the water, I'd like to take the helmet with me. And start... Um... I don't know if stroking or petting is the better word, but the skull on top of the helmet. As you just brush your hands over the bone, there's some sort of feeling that washes over you. Something foreign. Something that you've never experienced before. And it feels almost as if something is pressing against your back. A sort of weight. Though you know nothing's there. And... You're not sure why. 
but your body begins to feel heavier and it feels more difficult to move. At this point, I'll beach myself to the point that my nostrils are sticking out of the water so I can breathe, but I'm going to completely throw open the gates of my mind and let it in, so to speak. And you do so. You slowly make your way over towards the ground of the swamp. And you almost try to enter this meditative state. Go ahead and make a straight intelligence check. Two. You've never done this before, and you're not quite sure what's going on. It confuses you and allows you, well, keeps you from concentrating. And you stay attempting at that for quite some time before eventually putting it to rest, as well as putting yourself to rest, as the pain that you've been ignoring. Uh, thus far begins to set in and um, the open wounds um, almost sting against the the water Um, is there anything else you'd like to do before you take a long rest Uh, just make sure that I have a claw on the skull as I go to sleep apart from that no easily done moving our eyes over to the other half of our group of adventurers. You make your way back into the interior of Castle Iron Grove. As I said before, the soldiers are not out and about anymore after the recent information has come to light. Though, Jessa leads his men um, back towards the barracks and the druids look to one another um, and turn into small bird-like creatures and fly away to some destination that you're not familiar with. Paton and Grafford, what would the both of you like to do? Is Jeffrey, like, still alive? <laughs> uh, Jeffrey is in his pocket dimension. He is not He actually took a few shots while you got shot. Okay. So you're going to have to recast the spell to bring him back. Alright, I'll do that later. But I I guess I'm going to go on a walk in a garden for some nice place. Very peaceful and quiet place. The rain has made its way to the kingdom. And is now slowly pit-pattering on the stones of the walkways the only garden that you know about is a garden inside the actual castle's walls just the phone's gonna go to that one all right grafford i think i'll just go back to uh, raldir's room and just unload All right, so the both of you make your way over to the castle walls. you share any words while doing so? No. <laughs> yeah. Still walking in silence. The only soft sounds of rain and nightly creatures beginning to make noise several small crickets you make your way into the interior the four guards standing post outside give you a nod as you approach and you make your way through the portcullis and from that point you go your separate ways
Grafford, is there anything, or rather, both of you, is there anything you'd like to do before eventually taking a long rest? John is just gonna try and be at peace in the garden for a couple of hours, maybe. I'm gonna try and distract myself by reading the book. Alright, so you spend another couple of hours, both of you, going about your own business until eventually, Paton, you make your way back up to um, Raldir's room. And Grafford, when you had made your way in first, you opened the door and then looked to the corner behind the door at where Raldir's thunder cannon had first laid. And you look at its empty spot And then a picture of Raldir flashes in front of your eyes for a moment in memory. And then you plop down on the much, much oversized bed for a gnome and read until exhaustion takes you. Eventually, Piton, you make your way up as well, and you see Grafford laying asleep on the bed, and you go over to the section in the corner where you have laid out plenty of uh, pillows or uh, throw pillows that have been scattered around and make your way to slumber as well. At this point, I'd like everybody to mark off a long rest and get everything back. Meanwhile, we move our eyes over to Raldir. Raldir. Mm -hmm. The image around you begins to slow as watch Twergeth fade into um, fade into leaves and then those leaves scatter off once again what do you okay. do? um hmm. well let's see I did use healing hands on him hmm Can I cure wounds myself? Um, you can, though the immediate danger of the situation around uh, seems to have passed. Um, okay, then yeah, I'm gonna wait on that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look around, make sure everyone's like all good, make sure Cog's all good. So you turn around immediately after watching a Torgath fade in his physical form, and you look at uh cog or reina um and she's clutching her side and you see a large pool of blood um underneath it mm. um pfft. yeah well i'm gonna gonna go over there and I guess uh, I guess I'll do cure wounds on her I guess alright now spell casting ability modifier it's intelligence for you intelligence yeah then that's uh, plus three and cure wounds is 1d8 okay let me just get that That is, yeah, five. Alright, um, so you close up some of the wound, but do you want to just tend to Cog spending as many spell slots as you need to? Yeah, sure. Alright, so it eventually takes all of them and it takes a little bit of time, but you eventually close the wound entirely um, cool. and as you're doing so 
uh, well, before you do so, you approach, um, and uh, she looks up at you as you are slightly taller, um, and then she says, Raldia, who was that? Well, he, and he is one of the, uh, how, how I should say, uh, higher ups in the society. But he seemed like he knew you. Well, from my days in Iron Grove, I know a lot of people. Go ahead and make a persuasion check. Because okay. you do know Twig and his family and mm. who he is. You're kind of not saying that. So go ahead and make a persuasion check. That was a 16. I'm going to make an insight. <laughs> Natural fucking 20. Oh my lord. Well, dear, I can tell when you're lying to me. Hmm. Well, um, his, his family is also player to DM. I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. Um, with his whole relation. He's a would not, and the other would not is the uh, is the guy. Am I yeah. correct? Yes. Okay. Poor guy is to... the same. He is of that family. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that he was related to the guy. Yes. Well, you can you can say his name. The audience has heard his name. Yeah. <laughs> well, the the you know the dude who's in control of the whole uh, you know. The arc, the arc druid, um, yeah, or Seth, I believe his name is. Ah, uh, yeah, but arc druid. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. The dude who's responsible for uh, the whole uh, defense mechanism. Yeah, Corseth would not. Yeah. Um. Okay. So yeah, I'll continue. And to put things simply, he's related to. The one who's in control of our whole defensive, uh, defensive measures with the whole, you know, moving trees and our illusions. I'm going to say waving my hand a little. You're sort of having this conversation as you're um, sealing the, the wound. Um, hmm. He looks at you with this sort of almost stern look and just simply says, What comes next? Well, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I mean, do we either go all in or we wait and... I feel like if we wait, they're just going to come back and attack again. What do we do? There's... They, they know what... What the island looks like, and... They... They, they know about the weapons now. <sighs> yes, which complicates things a little. Well, hmm. if I had a way of getting back, I mean, they wouldn't suspect anything from me. And if we had some sort of plan for once I was in there, then we could make this a hundred times easier. A 
I'm just going to say this now, so that way it doesn't bother me later. Why didn't you go? Well, simply put, um, I guess I... I guess I'm starting to see things the way that everyone here sees things. That, um, things might just not be right. I, you know, I care for people who are in need. And that's why I left in the first place. I, I saw how we treated our, our poor and our needy, and I just couldn't handle it. And I just feel like everyone here is just in need of help. She gazes at you in silence for a moment. And as you're staring into her greenish eyes, her pale gray skin, she begins to try and stand up. You pull your arms away to allow her to do. I I must report to a greatness. Of course. That's probably for the best. I will return by nightfall. More than likely there will be discussion as to what does come next, and I'll see you after. Okay. Thank you. It's nothing. I'm gonna say with a little smirk. Not just for healing me. And she begins to walk off. And she looks over her shoulder back at you. But for staying, too. And then continues walking. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm not gonna say anything at that. I'll just kinda... I'll watch her walk off, and I'm just gonna, I guess, stand around for a little bit. Just look around. Go ahead and make a perception check. Okay. That is a 17. 17. You gaze off into the distance and you see dark clouds on the horizon. And you're not quite uh, sure if they're coming in your direction, but you can tell that they're rain clouds. And mm -hmm. that they're sort of over where Iron Grove should be. Yeah. In that general direction and over the course of your conversation with cog the rest of the attackers um, have mostly returned but you see several squadrons of people going to recover those who were injured in combat flying down towards the tree line underneath the island and in search parties trying to recover the dead mm -hmm. and as you're watching you sort of just sit down for a moment dangling your legs over the side of the island which is kind of scary but at the same time you know you could just fly back up if you fell yeah yeah So you stand, and then sit, and you just gaze out, and you see a tiny brown dot in the distance, 
getting farther and farther away and smaller and smaller. And the look of betrayal on Twergith's face comes back to you. You sort of think about the repercussions of your decision and what it means and the possibilities of what could happen as a result of your decision. Not just for Cog, not just for your friends, but for the Ashborn and for the people of Iron Grove and how much of an impact your decision will have and the shockwaves that will ripple off of it. Go ahead and make a wisdom saving throw. Okay. That is a 18. It weighs heavily on you. And it gets pushed back to the back of your head, but you know that's only temporary. Mm -hmm. And after gazing out for a while, you stand up once again and begin making your way back. As you do so, you begin to see more blackish smoke beginning to spew out of the top of the mountain peaks. And the whole island rumbles for a moment and begins to move, altering its position for where it was before to try and go into hiding once again. You make your way back into the cave entrance to the interior of the Isle of Cinder, to the Den of Flames, as it is called, and you make your way through the tunnels. Where do you go? Um, is there any way that I haven't, like, particularly, like, been through yet? Like, is there any way that's, like, unexplored at this point? Not quite. You've spent two weeks here um, yeah. going out and about. Specifically, the only place that you haven't been to is Her Greatness's Quarters. Mm -hmm. Because Which that's I, not a public place. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say, uh, I wouldn't expect to have. Yeah, that's the only. You know where the room is just after exploring, but you've never. Yeah. It's the only room you haven't been in. Well, um, I guess I'm just gonna go back to uh, the the little place where the uh, or where we where I originally was working with the uh, thunder cannons and stuff, like the uh, the place with all the workers. And then there's the workshop. Yes, the workshop. I'm just gonna go back there, I guess. I would like to clarify at this point, just to put any um, questions to rest that you have not been sleeping inside the workshop you've been staying with cog over that time yeah yeah um just for the audience <laughs> yeah um so you head back there as it is still somewhat day but as you were making your way downwards the uh as, because you did stay out there for about two hours okay. just gazing out and thinking about everything yeah. And the hours of twilight and the encroaching dusk was coming as you made your way down. After two hours, Cog still isn't back. He's not in the workshop. And you wait there a while longer until eventually your exhaustion begins to take you and you make your way back towards her quarters. And as you make your way inside to the small room... She is not there either. She actually mm -hmm. doesn't come back for several more hours until you're not able to stay awake anymore and she doesn't come back. The morning after comes and you look around and you gaze down to your side and you find her form draped across. You're not sure when she made her way into the room 
you're glad that she did come home rather yeah. to the room um fairly shocked at this um i guess i'm just gonna i'm gonna say a little quieter well well look who look who decided to show up next to you yeah i know i'm just saying this to myself okay i'm gonna try to try to sl try to sl slip out go to make a stealth check okay <laughs> Because I know this it was not going to be the easiest, the easiest slip. Oof, four. You try and move slowly as to not awaken her, as you're not sure how long she's been asleep for. Um, and as you're moving and getting off the bed and dressing yourself um, from your nightly clothing, you hear her voice, sort of, just very softly. Please, I'm so tired. Let me sleep. Yes, go, go, go back to sleep. You've, you, you need it. I don't know when you came in last night. Only been here for ten minutes. Why? Did it, yes, sleep. Sleep for however long you need. Jeez. Stop talking, please. I'm going to roll my eyes at that, and I'm just going to continue just getting dressed, and I'm going to leave. Wait, wait. Ah, uh, okay. I'm going to go back over, I guess. You lean down. You kind of just, with a very tired look on her face, brings a hand up to your cheek. Thank you for staying. And she just gently kisses you. Um, at this, I will smile and I will say, uh, uh, the pleasure is all mine. And, and you see, as you are speaking, she's already yeah. fallen back asleep, exhausted. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to leave and I'm going to let her, let her sleep. All right. What do you plan on doing? With your day. Um, hmm. I'm going to go to the. Do I know where the uh, the throne room thing was? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, can I go in there? Yeah, sure. Okay. Or can I make my way over there? Begin to make your way over. Um, like once I am there. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to see if the uh, if Her Majesty is there. Oh, um, so as you make your, your way through the, the den of flames, um, you walk past many, many Ashborn. Um, it's a lot busier, um, than it has been in the past. And hmm. they seem almost as if they're preparing for something. Okay. And you make your way over towards um, the, the throne room. And you make your way inside as the two guards posted out front open the, the large, large doors, um, the hall doors. And as you make your way in, you see the long, stretching red carpet that leads up to the throne. And you see the unfaltering flame herself, Elijah Ashroot, gingerly okay, also... draped across the throne, wearing silken black robes. As I've been here for, uh, what is it, two weeks, you said? Yes, just about. A little over now. Yeah. Um, what What would I, as Raldir, call Her Majesty or the Undying Flame? The Unfaltering Flame. Unfaltering Flame. That's it. Um, Her Majesty works fine. Okay. I probably would call her that anyway. 
Um, I am going to approach the throne, and I'm going to give her a, a little half half salute thing, just kind of lazy, just her majesty. And I'm going to say with a bow of the head. For what reason do you disturb me? Well, I want to know what, uh, what's going to happen. What is the plan? <laughs> Your mistress has not informed you? No, um, she only got back ten minutes ago. Yes, I'm aware. I've been awake as long as she has. Though, one of my guard had alerted me to your presence just as I was to make my way to rest myself. Now then, as for the events of what have come to pass yesterday, your people have found us. We must act accordingly. The preparations are being made, and soon we fly for Iron Grove. Though there is something that I request of you. Okay. And she gingerly points one of her fingers down towards your hands. The crest of your family, you still bear it, and I am glad that you do, for we require its power. Yes, as I as I am aware, I'd say with a nod. She curls her finger in a beckoning sort of way. Okay, and I guess I will. And then after doing so, flattens her hand out and outstretches it towards you. Okay. Waiting. Um. Guess I'm gonna get over there. And. I'm gonna point at the ring like you want this? Yes, that is with what I was referring to. Okay. Uh, and then I guess I'll just take it off and I'll put it in her open hand. I'll a, drop it on. A portion of you hesitates. I was gonna. Uh, as you I was do so. Just about to add that. Yeah, it's it's a little hesitant at first, but then kind of shake it off a little. The magnitude and sort of metaphoric passing along of this ring with which you have bared over the course of your lifetime as you reach down to pull it off of your finger you gaze down into the the greenish gemstone with the bands of silver extending down with the royal crest and as you move it towards her brightness time almost slows and as you release your grasp on the ring and it slowly falls turning and landing in her hand make a wisdom saving throw okay that is a 17 you realize what you've just done you have given the Phoenix Rebellion, Rebellion means with which to make a direct assault on Iron Grove. 
you've given them away past the enchanted woods. And the magnitude of that adds on to with what you've already experienced and thought of. Mm. And she slowly curls her fingers over the ring and then pulls it closer to her body and gives it an inspection. It will take four days for us to make our way over castle. And when that day comes, I expect you to be leading our people as the symbol of justice and hope that we need you to be. As as was said when I first arrived, I'm going to say kind of again with a half-hearted nod. Now, please, leave my presence so that I may make my way to my own mistress. Uh, do what you will. Uh, it's none of my business, and I say putting my hands up as I walk out. And uh, you make your way out. And with that, we will... Well, actually, first, is there anything else you'd like to do? Um... I do not want to disturb Cog, so I'm going to go into the workshop just to kind of be in my own head for a little while, just to think, just to have time to think, because, you know, there's been a lot of big stuff that's just happened. Yeah. So I'm just going to sit in the workshop and I'm just going to ponder. I'm not going to do anything, just to think. All right. Um, and as you make your way inside and you look at some of the under cannons that are in the process of being built um sort of the parts just scattered across some of the workshop tables um you kind of look out at them and then you think about your own under cannon the original one the metaphoric seed with which this uncontrollable expansion and growth has come to fruition and then a memory shoots into your mind the memory of being shot by sorrow called on in his quarters and being given the task which has spiraled into the chaos that has been unfolding. And you then realize that you have not fulfilled what you said you were to fulfill. Hmm. What did I say I was going to do? Destroy all of the thunder cannons and mm. the blueprints. Which That's is right. not feasible anymore. Yeah. It's impossible at this point. So, you wait in the workshop and eventually Cog makes her way around midday over to the workshop as well. And business continues as usual. And with that, we will change our eyes back over to Castle Iron Grove. So, the morning comes afterward. I hope each of you have marked off your long rest. Mm -hmm. We will start with Grafford and Piton. What do you do? Hmm. I guess Piton is gonna look for visit since he didn't come back. 
effort. I guess we'll split up since I want to go talk to uh What was his name? I have it written down. Hold on. Uh the Archmage would not the Arc Druid. Remember that was a Arc mistake Druid. on my Thank part. Thank you. Let me fix that in editing. Yeah, I'll, I'll either find the guard captain or Arc Druid. You're not quite sure uh, where to find the Arc Druid, um, but you do know that um, the captain uh, should be at the barracks in his office. So you said you were also going to look for Yizit, though? Like, how are you going to go about that? Alrighty, so you. Wait, what was the question? Um, since you want to accomplish two things, Grafford, how are you going to go about accomplishing them? Since you said you also wanted to look for Yizit, but also do something else. I didn't. Oh, that would so. Be Piton. So you want to just look for either of them? Is because I, I I heard the word both. Anyway, um, so you're just going to make your way over towards the barracks then? Correct. Paton was the one saying something about use it. Alright, so, um... Uh, Paton. Where are you gonna look? Well, the last place I saw was at the airship, so, right? So, I might as well start my search there. Alright, you don't have a way of getting out of the city, though. Oh, it's outside of the city? Yes. Who do I know that can help me get outside for the city just for a little bit? You know that Jessa has a pendant that got you in the day before. Uh, Ponzi has a ring that he made that can open the door. Um, and the captain has a pendant as well. Or has a pendant. From what you remember as well. I'll go Try to find Jenna first. Jessa, you mean? Jessa, yes. Well, that means both of you are making your way over towards the barracks. Um, so as you make your way over, um, it's still raining. You make your way outside. The rain went completely through the night. Almost as if the, the woods and the area around is weeping. You make your way towards the barracks that are just outside of the castle walls. And you see several guards posted out and about. Um, you can maybe ask a guard for more information or... The choice is yours. Or just directly make your way there. I'm going to directly make my way there. Grafford? Ow. I mean, I really don't see the purpose of asking. Alright, make your way directly there. You make your way inside the barracks. Um, and up to the second floor, some of the officials and regulators uh, recognizing the both of you, um, sort of nodding as you make your way in, sort of slinging a thumb, like a sort of thumb pointing backwards over their shoulders. Um, and you make your way up to um, the second floor with the five doors along the left side of the wall. Um, you're going specifically to, uh, canonically, the captain that none of us have the name of. <laughs> Just captain. I have the name. Captain, captain? I think it was like Leo something. Oh, I never took down first name. I always take down last names. Uh, Bronstree. Bronstree. Okay, well, mm -hmm. Captain Bronstree. Um, 
I, I literally have him in, in my notes as Captain. None of us know the name of. Um, because I couldn't, I, I I couldn't remember which episode he first appeared in either. <laughs> um. All right, so you make your way uh, towards Bronze Street, then. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, knocking on the door. Oh boy, voice. <laughs> the sounds of the rain uh, disappearing as you make your way into building. Yes, come in. I do so. You open the door, um, and you make your way inside, uh, Paton following behind you. Ah, Captain Grafford, pleasure. And Paton, I would see. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the purpose of your visit? We are very busy. I came to see if you had any information on the whereabouts of Twig. Twergith. Uh, Twergith had made his way um, via the use of some interesting um, magic that I am not familiar with, though he has returned safe and sound and has given a report of the events that were to happen. I believe that you had shared in his experience as well. I only wanted to know if he was safe. He is within I... his father's care currently. I'm glad to hear. With also... the whereabouts of the young prince confirmed, we are on high alert and preparing for a more direct approach. Whenever that plan comes to fruition, you know where to find me. Though this conversation should mostly have been between you and I. Baton, is there more purpose for which you have joined your captain? I myself wanted to see if I could find a way outside to see if Yusuf was still on the ship. He didn't return last night. Ah, I see. Well, I believe Jessa still carries my pendant, and he is enjoying some rest and relaxation, R&R, &R, after the events of the day prior. May I know where he is so I can maybe ask him if he could help me get out for just a moment? As he is a soldier within the king's army, he is within the barracks. Alright, thank you. Yeah, Paton is gonna find Jenna in the barracks. <laughs> Jessa! Jessa! Jenna. Exactly. Jenna. I'm like Jenna. I don't know why. Um, I'll walk out soon. Good day. Before you do so. Grafford, if you have a moment. Yes. I'll close the door. You hop if up. If Paton doesn't. Because Paton opened the door for you before. Um, and you hop up and close the door. Please, have a seat. I will do so. You hop up on one of the, the chairs, but your head does not crest over the desk, so you stand instead. Um, T 
Twilgeth has informed us of some rather troubling news. And that would be? He mentioned that you were not familiar with the purpose with which he flew away from the airship. This is correct. That is? During his report, he mentioned that he had seen the young prince upon the island with a woman of their kind, with blonde hair and green eyes, ashen gray skin like the lot of them. And upon attempting to bring the young prince back to us, the young prince denied his attempts. Now, as he has been in your care until recently, I must ask you, in his past, how has he spoken of his people? To be honest with you, we barely heard about you when we got the mission to come over here. And how has he held us in his regards? To be honest, we hadn't known much about anything other than he told us he was royalty. So he shared no pride in his homeland or any negativity towards it? Not that I know of. When he had first left, two years ago, of his own accord, he was a man of his kingdom, singing our praises. For him to be silent. I will be blunt in my questioning. What have you done to him? And he is going to cast the Zone of Truth. Make a Charisma saving throw. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Because I believe I have something that helps me in case... Your gnomish um, racial does give you advantage on saves against magic. Yeah. Just advantage, correct? Yeah, gnome cunning. Intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Cool. So I do have an advantage against that. Ten. Ten? Mm-hmm. Fail. You feel a magical presence enter your mind, and you cannot lie for the duration of the spell. Mm-hmm. What have you done to the young prince, and why he no longer holds us within his high regards? It's not what I have done. When he heard the mission, he was excited to come back. Although... He was worried about the mission's content. What was the reasoning for you to return the young prince to us? You have mentioned in the past a mission, though you have not shared the contents and details of this mission. The mission was to come back and destroy the blueprints. For if they were to spread, it caused mass havoc. Weapons of mass destruction as you've seen, well, as your guards, soldiers, have seen, 
would be catastrophic if they were left to mass produce. We were sent to destroy the blueprints and the weapon. And should you complete your mission, what is to happen to the young prince? Was he to return or stay with his people? I was told to kill him. And he looks at you with a look of disbelief. Has the spell taken effect? Or do you lie to me? The spell is in full effect. But if you want the truth, I, would, I was going to show him the letter. And not kill him. The man who ordered the death of the young prince is an enemy to the kingdom. Who is this man? Soro Kaldan. This letter that you speak of, is it within your possession? It is not on my person. It is in the airship. Then you will go with Piton and recover this document and bring it back to my office so that we may discuss its repercussions. Of course. Now be gone. I must think. And he begins to rifle through parchments that are scattered across the desk. I will exit and look for Paton. Paton, make a perception check. With disadvantage. Make a perception check. Too short. Because you're looking for Jessa. Not Jenna. Or Jonah, but Jessa. Uh, <laughs> Giuseppe. What was Giuseppe. the number? 12. 12? <laughs> yeah. 12. After asking around with some people, you eventually do find him um, on the first floor. And you approach him. Um, Grafford catch catches up too because reasons. Um, it takes you a little while to find him. Uh, yes? Uh, how can I help you? Um, we were wondering if you can get us outside so we could check and use it. He hasn't come back since last night. That is troubling. Um, please, uh, take this. I'm sure you'll, you know how to use it and return it to the captain for me. I had forgotten to hand it back to him during my report. Alright. Get well, be well soon. Uh, I will. I just need some rest. And the fun shall head out now to go check on Yusuf with Grafford. And with that, we are going to take a break. Uh, we will see you all in the second half of our show. Uh, in the meantime, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we are going to be taking about a 15 to 20 minute break to fill back on refreshments and um, take care of anything else that needs to be taken care of. And in that time, we those who do stick around uh, will be responding to uh, questions and statements in the chat and sort of spending some time with those of you who stay during the break though we do suggest that you do the same as well um those of you watching on youtube you can find the second part of the episode in the playlist just after this one if you're watching it on the playlist if not just look for the second part of arisen episode 16 fears realized and with that for everybody here at the universe we'll see you in the second half <laughs>